Okay. Um, thank you all for coming on a wet day and everything. Like, it's nice to see you all here. And uh, Jesus, great. We're going to be all echoey, huh? Anyway, um, Kathy and I thought this was a great opportunity to go back and look at a bunch of old work. And so there's a 300 slides in here. So we figured out that there's um, 10 seconds a slide. <laughs> and since we've already spoken 15 seconds, it means there's nine seconds a slide. Right? <laughs> so they're going to go very quickly, especially in the beginning. And then when we get to the end, there's a couple projects that Kathy's going to show you that's in more detail. And if we have some more time, we'll go into more. It could go on forever. So we'll just cut it off when I see you guys all fading. <laughs> all right? So, Kathy, you want to get going? Can you see them? This one? Oh, there they are. Okay. Those, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, the, the um, beautiful house that you see on the screen there is uh, I saw advertised in the newspaper uh, in 1974 as in La Jolla, house for sale, $500. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and I had $500. I didn't have much more than that. But I just went over irresponsibly on my lunch hour and bought it, <laughs> knowing that I had to be moved and realizing I had no place to move it to. So, at any rate, um, whoops, wait a minute now. Where, don't, I wanted to do it. I'm sorry. There we go. But anyway, it was cool. I found uh, about uh, just several blocks from the site, which uh, the house had to be moved because it was making space for an addition to La Jolla High School. And so I found this beautiful little third of an acre site that was on a bicycle path, so there were access issues, but that made it very inexpensive. And I, I was able to purchase that and then um, have the house move there, which was just, you could do it for me. And so here it is on its way and um, and having a few difficulties. <laughs> this is when the, the, the La Jolla light came out. And um, it's like, and there she sits at the bottom of the bicycle path on the way up um, um, to the top of the hill. There's, there's the director there on the bottom yeah. of the right. Now, I think I said at this moment to them something to that, no, don't you understand, it's on top of the hill. <laughs> so at any rate, there she is. Um, you know, you know, maybe no Irving Gill, but it was just an absolute joy to live there and have a total cost of construction be forty-five thousand dollars. And um, so, and this is where I began my practice of Kathleen McCormick, design consulting. Yes. Okay, so that's Kathy's beginnings. I didn't know Kathy at the time, and she's uh, doing development already. So I, I got this job um, through. Um, my dad, <laughs> the way all architect practices get going. And so I had this uh, little thing on the Miramar Federal Credit Union building that then evolved to this larger Miramar building, our Miramar Road. And we were all into making buildings looking like the neighbors by then. It was the beginning of postmodernism. And so everything had to look like something else. And so we thought our building should look like, and ours is the one in the rear, should look like the Mayflower building on the front. <laughs> Um, that got me enough money to build my first house, which is this one in Delmar Terrace, done about the same time as Kathy was moving her house. And so it was, uh, it was interesting that we were both there. Kathy actually had bought a property in Delmar Terrace also. Um, but this, this house, um, I remember, was kind of a collection of a bunch of different things that would go together. Um, old-fashioned windows and things, which at the point were like, wow, they're old-fashioned windows. How strange. And then we saw this blue tile was happening in all the restaurants in Del Mar at the time. And the inside of it. So we're going to go through these 300 slides pretty quick. Um, and then I wouldn't show this slide except we got into this whole thing of finding everything we'd ever done. And I look back at this as not a very good piece of architecture, but I did it for a real estate agent, Andy Nelson, who in fact hooked me up to my whole practice. And so it was this one person that made it all happen. And yeah, I made him a funny looking old building. And in those days, we were kind of going, Heck with modernism. You know, we're tired of modernism. It's 1973, 4, 5, and you know, 1968, the world changed, and all that stuff happened. And it was now all right to have a house with a gable roof. And so we were kind of excited you could actually make a, a building that somebody would like, right? Instead of ones that you had to convince them were modern and they would like it. That led to this little, my first real little house was in Delmar Terrace, um, and it led to this one. Um, 
again, a client that came through Andy that knew the other guy that, you know, knew the thing. And Del Mar Terrace at the time had no houses on it. You could buy these lots for like 8,000 bucks and put these houses in. <coughs> and they're all million dollar lots today. And we did a series of spec houses for uh, Andy Nelson and Dave Stockton, a contractor, who, uh, um, you know, we'd do these little houses basically and sell them one at a time. And my fee was like $1,200. We could get a permit in two weeks. I'd go down and meet Mike Stepner at the building department. He'd be in the back of the counter. And, and Mike would go, oh my God, it's gonna, take, it's gonna take two weeks to get this permit. And we were like, oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> Why did I do this though? Next, screen, four, forward. Oh. Why is it not going anymore? Click the mouse. Oh, can we do it that way? That would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Anyway, these postmodern buildings that we started doing in the early 80s, um, where we could be completely irreverent, modernism was bad, Vietnam War was bad, our dads were bad, Corbusier was bad, Nice van der Rohe was bad, everybody was bad, and we were doing old fashioned, funny looking houses like this. And we had a great time doing it. Um, this one was built over a pool in Del Mar Terrace. Um, like that, and then these clients years later let me build this funny chimney. And we were this house in La Jolla it was just, you know, what are they doing? Any anything that was not, not modernism, right? And here's a split gable, which you know, I don't know if you guys Venturi's famous mother's house. So you've always got to do an homage to the famous architect. This is um, was the house I did in '76 or so. Another one in I don't go by quickly. Looks pretty ugly now. This one we did in, um, up in uh, uh, Carlsbad, and it basically took a Victorian building across the street and combined it with the Navy um, buildings that were all these white boxes in the back. So we thought we were blending together the buildings to the left and right of the projects into concoctions we called Blendo at the time. <laughs> this, this, uh, this, this one was in Avocado Grove. And so we're going, what the heck do we do with a tree in an a house in an avocado grove? We don't have another house to make it look like. So we decided to make it look like the avocado grove. And that's, that's how this house evolved out of, uh, again, the blend of thought that you could make it look like the surroundings. And so this farmhouse that we did out in the avocado grove. Um, this one is in um, Mission Beach. And it was, um, it had a funny zoning ordinance that seemed to make a boat. And we'd seen these boats to get moved onto properties. There was some up in Encinitas that we thought were really cool. So we talked the clients here into building a boat. These first things we're showing are all client work. <laughs> so we, made, we thought a boat would be a nice thing to sit in, in Mission Beach. And then later we started getting a little more into what became postmodern evolved into this sort of um, boxier, multi-material buildings we did in Del Mar. And then Kathy, um, Kathy and I got together around here, around this time. And this is the first building Kathy did for in the office. And it was a pool house out in the back of uh, a rich man's house we'd done a bit earlier. Howard Berndorf, who was a symbiote with a cancer cure guy at Hybrid Tech, and he was real, real wealthy. Go ahead. So, in, so he, with his, uh, what he needed to have a tennis court and a pool house, and within the pool house, a little guest house. And so it was kind of a very luxurious um, program. And I, Ted at the time was extremely interested in doing affordable housing. And, uh, and I, I just happened to be there raising my hand, well, I don't, I don't mind having a good budget. So anyway, so, we had, so I had the great fortune of working with Ted for the first time in a, more in, in a capacity of being an architect as opposed to being a colorist. That she had been doing for Rob Quigley for 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so there she is. And I was so proud when we, we won an AIA award for it. The second project that I worked on was Meltsaw, um, another house in, in La, Jolla, La Jolla, excuse me, that was a, kind of a ranch house that they, the clients were wonderful. They just wanted a room. Uh, you know, no, just a room, a room with a view and a terrace. And so created the system where we sort of bridged, uh, a bridge both of the original volumes of the house. And this house is important because uh, years prior, 
I had done an edition for Seven Carabin and Sharon Leitner in Coronado, and they happened to see this house published, and um, and um, and then and and said, "Well, we're going to take you up on what we talked about." Remember when you were here and you said, "Well, sometime we had such a good time working together. Sometime." You wanted us to buy you a lot so we could make a house together. And, I, and we see you're working with Ted Smith. And I said, yes. And they said, well, we found this property in Coronado. We'd like to do a spec house on it. And um, would you guys like to come over and check it out? And I said, sure, of course. And of course, Ted uh, brilliantly just looked at the property and immediately said, oh, we can put two houses here, not one. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but but since it was a speculative project, it was pretty neat. And working in, in Coronado, which a, a place that we just adore, but it has, when you go to Coronado, you're in another world. It's like, you know, lovely old homes. And the, 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 the Lightners lived in a turn of the century house. It was just gorgeous. And um, so at any rate, we thought that to try to make the houses as broad as possible. So they had kind of a, a presence on the street, like we admired so much about many of the Coronado houses. And white, of course, seemed appropriate. And so this is the, the one that I was primarily responsible for. And, uh, and well, that's how Kathy and I always work together. We'll slice it up. You get that part, I get this part. And that's how come we still are happily together. <laughs> <laughs> true. That's really true. Well, that this, it, was, this was Kathy's. Yeah, so it was, they were, it was, it was really great. And, um, and then when this project got done, um, the light. Uh, well, you got one more. When, yes. This was my one. And the idea, and you saw the first picture, when you looked straight at that, it looked like a normal house. Yeah. <laughs> but you looked at it from an angle, like, what in the heck is that? So that was the, the problem. <laughs> Kathy was doing real beautiful old houses, and I was doing kind of postmodern, weird houses. <laughs> then, you know, they had the same dream. It was sort of, well, yeah, it was definitely, I, my goal was regionalism at that time. I really, I was in love with uh, what I call red house, green house, so the uh, dragon colony in La Jolla. And um, I just thought, whenever I would look at those buildings, I just loved early California bungalow. And since this was one of my first projects, I thought, why not do that, you know? So at any rate, so but then again, what happened is they, Lightners liked this project. They made a great deal of money with it. And, um, and so they, now they called and said, hey, we, we have another lot we'd like you to work on. But this time, we want to move from a gorgeous turn of the century house that's near the Hotel Dell and live in it. And so they bought this piece of property on Fifth Avenue um, uh, in Coronado and a very busy street. And uh, we thought uh, uh, that it should be a courtyard house so that the, and set the, the so that you feel like you entered and the big body of the house was set very far back from the street and detailing it in a more or less Irving Gale bungalow kind of styling is entering it. I, always, I felt like I wanted it to feel like a monastery, you know, like a, to create as much sense of serenity as possible on that busy street. And so there she is, looking up towards the bedroom. And the, the living room opens out, you know, very simply onto the yard. And at the same time, as Ted mentioned before, I was still working, um, not was still, but I, well, working at the same time as a, a colorist, primarily for Rob Quigley, a few other people. But um, this was, that there, I'm still working in that situation with Rob, which has been an absolute delight over the years. And uh, but I just showing this particular project because this is the first one I helped him with, the Sayer residence. And I was thrilled to be invited into the firm to uh, work with them. Um, later on, uh, uh, one of the projects I had helped in a sense of color and material uh, was the Volkers residence. And, um, and because uh, they knew me, Rob recommended me to them to do an addition to that house. Um, and uh, the red portion of the house is the, is the Quigley portion of the house, and the other volume is the, the, is the addition. There are a lot of rich materials in the inside. And this is the, the house was, the addition was 
designed to sort of weave itself uh, uh, with the rocks in the back. Another great project that I particularly loved uh, because of its simplicity was uh, working with uh, Andy Spurlock and John Richardson. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, um, Andy Spurlock and Richard and Martin Poirier were the uh, landscape architects for all of the Leitner projects. And so they saw them and anyway, invited me to help them um, uh, re uh, remodel and do a small addition to a very tiny little house that they bought in, in Hillcrest. And I loved it that they didn't want to make a big deal out of the front. I mean, they wanted to just keep it, just, just keep it pretty much the way that it is. And just clean it up a little bit. I added this sort of wooden surround in the entry. And um, they really wanted to make a kit. John was a great cook. The big thing you wanted, they wanted was a great kitchen. And they didn't care if they had a very tiny little bedroom. So we, we made the tiny little kitchen into a tiny little bedroom and then added a, a court, basically, in the backyard of 18 by 20 foot wide volume that became the, the, became the kitchen. And uh, the, the, the primary reason uh, for the whole house was to make a, a space for Andy's garden. And so it, it again is, it, and they love the Leitner house, so they want, it, it's a courtyard house as well. And this is the gar his beautiful garden. And there are my buddies sitting right there. So, okay, so here we are a little bit later, and we're back to the tent half of the act. Let's see. This is uh, Kim McConnell and Jean Lowe, a house that we did for. Uh, the head of the art department at UCSD. And he came and they they wanted a really simple house, so we gave them this um, 120 foot long, 12 foot wide house. Had four rooms in it and opened up to this marsh on the back. And the new rooms were this simple concrete block building. This building went up in five months. It's the fastest building I've ever had built. It was all concrete. What we've done in other times is we'll do half concrete and change to something else that takes it forever. But this house has went up so fast and so quickly that it was really uh, our introduction to um, masonry in a real way. And Kim insisted that it be random masonry, random colors, you know, which is then we started doing on a whole bunch of projects. We had this, uh, this on well, the model, this was the top of a uh, uh, magic marker that we sat on the little model and that became the bathroom. There's Kim and Jean. So it, we, we did that little introduction because we love clients. We've had some really great clients through the years. Um, but um, the fun things have been housing because housing is kind of where the whole practice deviated from doing custom homes and we became builders. And again, Kathy and I um, had started our careers as builders, kind of had a, a lucky reprieve of doing houses and then got back to building. This one um, for John French, who actually um, was running for city council at the time or something, but he, he basically had this uh, lot and the houses on the ridge on the back, we knew were gonna be all you could really see when you look at the house, all you're gonna really see was the houses in the back. So what we wanted to do was make an architecture that piled up to the back and in fact, uh, the same thing made it look like the houses up on the hill. So this was kind of like, oh, I know what does the house look like? It looks like the one next door. In this case, it was the one above it. And when you got um, to the inside of this house, this is the, we've done the spec houses a lot. And we thought every time we did a spec house, we had to say, how big is the living room? How big is the dining room? Is there a family room? Is there, you know, all the pieces of houses. And we were trying to say, wouldn't it be nice to do a spec house where there's no partitions inside? And that the, the um, buyers come up and say, no, I want a country kitchen or I want a parlor and a big living room, or, you know, or, or I want to have the different ways. So I had all this cabinets that Kathy and I worked on together and made this house with no partitions on the inside. And we had made this chessboard and these pieces and we, we imagined ourselves sitting with the buyers and playing chess with them as we figured out how to make their house go together. So that loft interior led to this kind of thing. Again, this is Del Mar Terrace uh, in 1982, 81. And we'd gone into a horrible recession. I had a lot of time to just draw pictures. And so I, I would sit there and go, I know I have one little lot, which is way over to the right. I don't have a pointer, but I decided when I designed one house, I designed the whole neighborhood. 
So I would start, when I would draw it, I'd just draw the whole neighborhood and imagine how it would weave together into some sort of pedestrian place. And then when we finally built something, we built this little house for 10,000 bucks, and it was in uh, 12 feet by 20 feet, 20 feet high, and Peter Spraggs, a wonderful guitar player, was a buddy, of, and he bought it, put 10,000 bucks up, offered to pay 400 bucks of the mortgage payment, on the, was 800 bucks on the land. Then I looked around and said, anybody else got 10,000 bucks? I'll build you another little box. So we added, and these little boxes were just, they're nothing inside them. 10,000 bucks, you could get walls around the house, but not around the bathroom. <laughs> and I always figured that, you know, they would have money to go buy, go to Home Depot, and who wants to have mortgage for your bathroom walls? You might as well just go buy them, right? Buy them directly. So this house um, was one house, but it, by the time we were done, we had four or five partners come up and want to have a piece of it. And we kept adding another 10,000 piece, another 10,000 piece onto the thing. And then let everybody do the facades the way they wanted. And it's just by, by way of note. It's interesting because when I did the uh, remodel for the uh, Lightners, uh, they gave us their old windows. And those are the old windows from the Lightner house. So. The ones on the top, the little French yeah. windows, are 100, <laughs> now they're like 140 years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you touch this building since it was made for nothing, it kind of... The paint was holding it together. <laughs> Here we go. It's true. Um, and then we did additions. Every time we turned around, a friend would show up with another $10,000 bill. So we did 40 of these over a period of time. Um, these one in another one where we actually lived and worked, and Robin was here with a bunch of other cohorts from Cal Poly. And he came to work with us at that time. And we all, Robin and we all lived here, worked here in uh, Del Mar Terrace. There's Kathy in the front yard. Um, and we always like to laugh about this house as kind of anti-house. The ones on the top of the hill are the Indians coming over the top. <laughs> and we're, we're down on the marsh, you know, and kind of going like, well, yeah, your house should be like this. And again, it was just a, well, a shell of a house. Everybody had the same. We did another one here that we wanted to look like the old German dance hall that had been um, remodeled and no longer was this beautiful facade on the marsh. So we decided we'll be the old facade on the marsh. And we actually had the dance sign uh, that we were going to try to put on this that got stopped by the planning group. Um, and these we did, here's a few more of these go homes in the neighborhood that we did. This one we call the Gone Home because by 1988, um, seven, uh, the neighbors had decided we don't want affordable housing in Del Mar Terrace. <laughs> and Peter Navarro, who is famous now as Donald Trump's idiot, is, was running for mayor. And he, uh, he used our go home projects as a reason to stop to organize the neighborhood against affordable housing in their neighborhood. So we had this horrible um, fight with him. And at one point they're saying, your houses are dragging down the value of the houses in Del Mar Terrace with your stupid affordability. And we're going, no, okay, we'll just sell one of them. So we sold this house for more money, which is an eight sweet go home. Sold it for more than any house that ever been sold in Del Mar Terrace and said, the heck with you, we're out of here. <laughs> About that time, Rob Quigley had built the Beaumont building downtown, and we were just going, I've had it with Del Mar Terrace, with NIMBY groups, with community groups, with the whole thing, I've had it with them. We're going to follow Rob downtown, because he said, look, i got a 50 by 50 lot, I can build as tall as I want, i got no setbacks, I've got no NIMBYs. And so we're sitting there going, that is the future. So Kathy, <laughs> uh, Kathy came up with some money, and I, one Sunday morning, she just came, look, I found a lot downtown, $150,000 downtown. No setbacks, no high limit, no anything. And we're going, heck with Del Mar. And off we went, built this house uh, where Kathy lived on this terrace for many, many years. Um, it was a wonderful situation for us, the way our lifestyle is, because Ted lived at the green portion of the building, the go-home portion of the building. My I dream to build, if I was going to build anything, was to build a townhouse or more appropriately called a row house. This is before Jonathan Siegel showed up. And so, I, I, I don't know, I think it may, I don't know, but I think it may have been the first of that type of housing in San Diego at that time, because whenever we went to great cities, that's what we'd see as you walk along the street, our row houses, and we love them. And so this is a, a, a shot from the inside, and I lived in the, the what, eight, four floor, uh, townhouse at the end with the penthouse and then Ted lived in the go home section with his office. We both had our offices there and then we shared the terrace. And it, w it was really uh, just a perfect 
perfect way for us to live. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to rush. I thought there was another picture, but this is the Lynn Project. <laughs> <laughs> You done with your part? <laughs> right, so. <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, the Lynn Block was this wonderful opportunity. Rob Quigley and Jonathan Siegel came to me to join their team to go after this um, civic, uh, Center City Redevelopment Agency, the predecessor of Civic, um, housing demonstration block in Little Italy. And there was nothing in Little Italy at the time. And they had consolidated this whole block. And the first thing we said, the last thing you want in the world is one big project. We're going to break your consolidated lot back up into 25 lots, which is what we did. Jonathan making the row houses at the bottom, which were the first fee simple um, non-condominium project done in California, and has become the basis for the small lot ordinances that are happening in a number of places. Uh, Rob Quigley on the upper left hand did the uh, tax credit affordable housing project. And then we, Kathy, did a building um, just to the right of that, the longer one with the little green tongue into the courtyard for uh, Mike Colosso, who was the, the low-cost housing developer of the other one. And then Robin Brisbois saved the uh, Harbor Marine building up in the corner and as a member of the Smith and Others team. And then Jim Brown also did one here. And Lloyd Russell and I did the Merrimack building in the middle. So we had this great big old model where everybody built their part of the block. We put it all together. And you could sort of sit back and look, oh my gosh, look what's going to happen when it all comes together. And the Merrimack building was um, Lloyd Russell and my contribution to that effort, and where the Smith and others offices are still today. And it's uh, we like the building because it's narrow and blows through and cross ventilates and doesn't have corridors and all that kind of stuff. And Kathy did this one for, um, for Mike Colosso, who was a developer of the affordable housing project with Rob. And his idea was to make um, uh, housing below and have his own house at the top, the, the, the red portion of the house. And there it is, kind of finished. We thought it was kind of a lighthouse in the middle of the moon block. Yeah, it, yeah, and it, it, uh, the graphic pattern was because it was very low budget and it was <coughs> a lot of little punctured windows and I thought perhaps an overlay of pattern might be interesting. And it, and it looked kind of good for Ted and Lloyd's project. And here, I love the front now. This this one, this sits on India Street, and it, it uh, often, when it, the ivy grows over, it looks kind of like a big teddy bear, and I, I think it looks great that way. So then Lloyd um, wants to keep going. I'm, I'm already reaching the end of my sprint at this point. But Lloyd says, look, I found another lot, and we, Lloyd and I did the uh, Essex building together. The idea here was to park on top of the parking and not park in the parking. <laughs> So basically we could get concrete housing and the affordability allowed us to make way less density by not having to build a parking garage. And this, this sort of was leading to our, um, our MRED program that we uh, got going around the same time where we teach architects not to be architects because they'll do have a lot more fun being builders. And uh, Andrew Maylox here is one of our proud graduates who's done, done a number of good buildings. Anyway, boy, I'm so, the, the, the work, the infill stuff, won't get done by normal developers because you can't do little projects and, you know, you can do a big project in three years or a little project in three years. So developers all want to build the big ones. So the thing about the MRED program was to try to teach architects, young architects, to build these infill projects that need to get done. Um, Kim McConnell um, later put this mural on it for us, which was a, a beacon to commuters coming into San Diego saying, get rid of your SUV and move downtown and enjoy a walkable life. <laughs> um, and then Robin and I now have, are the proprietors of Harbor Breakfast in the bottom of his building that we did a few years ago as just sort of retirement. You know, Ted got his students together, we got a bunch of tools and we sat in there for a year with paper on the windows and just had a great time building it. And at this point, we're breaking into not the quick look. Kathy's gonna show you. <laughs> It's 10 o'clock, so we have actually spoken for 25 minutes, oh. even though it's really late, you guys. And, it's, and the buttons are, yeah, yeah. this is going to be a long version of this. Oh, uh, I'll try to not make it be so very long, but it is real personal because I'm going to go back to, whoops, where did that person go? Anyway, uh, I found this property um, and owned it about 11 years before there was any possible way I could uh, design a house for it. I had always been kind of envious of Ted making his beautiful blue wall um, that he already had built when I met him somewhat 
at that point, 30 years prior. And uh, so I, this was in Hillcrest, a real pretty old street that was, uh, for the most part, uh, had started being built upon at the turn of the century. Uh, and so I bought like a canyon site where all those trees are. That's a part of the Yeah, okay, that's great. <laughs> so I like this, but here's Kathy. This is how things get done. <laughs> She'll sit there and make that model over for a few months. A little bit different, cut it down, make it over. <laughs> anyway, here was the model as it went in, and here we are um, you, you, after we got back to construction. Um, Kathy just went and showed up with a permit one day. I was going, like, how are you ever going to do that? And in Mid-City, uh, all the most reviews you could ever come with. And she shows up with a permit, and I'm going, oh my god, that house is going to be really expensive. I guess we're building it with students. And so here we were building the house <laughs> and pouring the concrete. And oh, this is always fun, because Kathy, um, as masons are stacking their blocks up, she's going around picking every block up, figuring out which side is the best block, <laughs> and sticking a little blue tab on it. <laughs> And making the masons grab the block and turn it. <laughs> anyway, that's the kind of thing that Kathy likes to do. <laughs> Drives me crazy, but it's all right. There she is, counting every block, and uh, there I am, pretending I'm actually working. We were building that house. Yeah. So it was all just—it was just such a delight. The whole thing was just the most wonderful process for the <laughs> students and every and everyone. And um, we built it like two days a week for three years. Yeah. Because we could only get the students for two days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but I felt it was important to me to set the, uh, it's an old neighborhood. I thought it was a, a good, uh, for a lot of reasons, to set the house far back from the street, uh, 80 feet back from, from Albatross Street, and, and, um, and try to save as many trees as possible. And, and, and very important to allow that beautiful canyon that come up from San Diego to flow through. The, the property pretty much terminates the, the, a, a finger of a canyon. And so I thought it was just very important to allow the canyon to be the more, the more important. Okay, and so there, there it is kind of closed. It's, what, it's intended that it would be like a concrete structure and then you just kind of put a glass dress over it. And there she sits. And we made this concrete steps to go intentionally to go down into the canyon so as that you really experience the walk to the house by touching the canyon floor. And then as you approach the house, um, you can see that the, the, the southern side is cantilevered just a little bit off of the ground where, where the, the, hell, the house became very, the, the site became very steep and that was, uh, and also I thought it would be a, a look great. Um, when you, when you, also as you approach the front door, you, you'll see that the, the last step is actually the slab, the concrete slab, which was nine and a half inches uh, thick, which was okay at that time. And um, I love that because I felt as though when you approach the house, you are entering like a special place, you know, a kind of sacred place. And for me, it is a sacred place, and I think it is for Ted too. Yep, we're really sacred when we're over there. <laughs> I'm sacred on the couch. <laughs> anyway, and I love the idea of when working, I pay a lot of attention to materiality. I love the sort of raw and authenticness of concrete and um, juxtaposed very thin, as narrow as possible, steel, steel windows. We designed the, the window wall, and it was, much of it was custom. And the roof is, the eave is a quarter inch plate steel that ties in the same sort of materiality as the window wall. And this is a view from the living room, back out. You see the front, you just come in the front door, there's no foyer, you just boom, you're right in because you've already gone into it, gone from 80 feet to get there. I figured it didn't need a foyer. And these are, the photographs are all mixed up from, these were taken, I think, about the first morning I was there. And um, you can see how 
there's a sense of, I, I think I love the authenticity. I love the fact that that concrete stair um, is the same as the one that's outside. Yeah, and so it kind of gives it a sense that maybe it was there, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was there before, not such a disruption. And the fireplace, which is used constantly because we've never turned the heat on. And uh, a view back through where you see the steps and the outside steps. And kind of soaring around here. It's the kitchen. And I love the sense of changing scale. You know, like if you have something sort of weighty and heavy, making the skinniest, tiniest little thing. I may have overdone it here, but I did. <laughs> I kept saying you need a bag of I know, but I could not put it in no matter what. It does wiggle a little bit. Uh, anyway, so there we have it. There's that view through that angle of the house and, and the night shot. And um, I spent a lot of time uh, after the house was built uh, laying these uh, stone pavers that were, um, I got into it, it took months to do, but it was. But you check these things out, you guys. This is Kathy at her Kathiest. <laughs> She's sitting there making that little thing, that boot, fit into that other block. Chip, 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 chip. There was a pile of chip flagstone <laughs> as big as the Paris. <laughs> and so this fitting, I, I really love this stuff because it's, to me, it's just. The degree Kathy gets to that I never do. Because I, I always am just saying, I gotta go, get it done, I got a real schedule. <laughs> and so, you know, but this kind of thing you get to do with your own house, right? Yeah. And it's like the feeling of rubbing it, if you will, of feel it when you, you know, being, it's become a personal thing. It's like the more you rub it, even if it's not perfect, the house is far from perfect. Um, um, it, it just, it, it just, a nice, a, a, this give, gives me a really good sense. Have you been going backwards again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still going yeah there we go. So there we are. And in the rear of the house, there's a, this, uh, a small little terrace area uh, that, um, that opens into uh, a room there that, uh, if, if used, becomes like a private part of the house. So that part of the house has its own private terrace. It's used now as a painting studio, and so it doesn't look anything like the guest house I assumed it was going to look like. It's just <laughs> an enormous mess. And so, and soaring around, uh, because the, the site is a two-sided property, um, it, 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 the, the access to the carport comes from another street, the street in the rear. And so we were going up to that carport here, thought it was really important to try to keep the house as pristine as possible, but leave the yard and the garden and everything else that's there very organic. And even the parts like this that we built um, to feel organic. And well, I should also point out that all those rock rocks were dug up from the site. Yeah. And so moved. <laughs> you know when you go around Mission Hills, you see those rock walls. They all come right out of the ground, which is the neat thing about that site. And there were all, those things were everywhere. Yeah. But they were valuable as well. For you. They were, yeah. And it was uh, anyway. That it seemed anyway. So here's a, a drone shot that was uh, taken, and so you kind of see really what the massing and all is, is kind of like. You, you soar around the house. It's experience, kind of like a spiral. Like you go inside and outside. And so I'm taking you up to the carport now, and uh, I like that the back of the house. Uh, referenced the the white boxes that I saw from the rear of the house and sort of just became one more of those. And there we are. The same color in the kitchen as in the color for it. Same paint too. It's showed the paint is crazy. And um, at this point, now we're done with the concrete. Once entered on this level, we're in wood construction and uh, it, it, it becomes, everything becomes lighter. Uh, uh, and more you thrill. There's a staircase that goes up to the office, and throughout that upper level, you can always see through to the down, through the to the lot. It's like a, a transparent house. There are vistas through everywhere. 
no hallways. The, the spaces are a series of rooms that are uh, veritably one room thick. So it's just like a series of rooms that move up towards the sky in a, uh, and, and they compre the, the second level compresses as you reach there. And then um, that's the bedroom area. And, and you can see I do have shades. <laughs> and there's a view towards the bathroom. And everything's open. There's only two doors in the entire house, which are on to toilet room doors. And they haven't been built yet. So there you have it. <laughs> and this looks huge. I would never have a bathroom that big. But it's just the perspective of it. So now we're going up to the office where I work. And we have a real office, but when I work, I typically do my work here in, in, my, in my spot. And it has its own terrace, which is nice, and has this tiniest little thin um, uh, 3 sixteenths of an inch tile that's blue that gives it a kind of feeling that it might be water or a tub or something like that. It's just kind of refreshing. You can't see in that picture, but there's a little distant blue of the bay out there, too. And it's kind of going back down with all those vistas. And, and there's the living room, kind of. It's, it's different now, again. Everything just constantly changes. And the, the night shot. And around this same time, I um, was asked to do a house for um, David and Linda Weinman in Del Mar, back in Ted's neighborhood. I should, I should point out, and Kathy goes into this other one we're going to look at real closely, is that this is a house for a client. And we're more showing it sort of a process that Kathy and I do. Here's a model that I started making as we first got it going. And it sort of starts being like, you know, what's it going to be? And we go back and forth with models. And then at some point, it becomes Kathy's in this case. And then she does the actual touching, putting the windows in place, and making the real thing from a rough idea of where we think the room should be. But again, this is for a client, which we contrast to the best house we did, which was a development that Kathy did, which was a step house. And basically, um, it's really a similar thing, except we don't have to do quite as much presentation and stuff. With the, you can go ahead and tell me more of these presentations. Well, I just wanted to say that in each of these uh, images that you're seeing are just sort of different renditions. Of we tried uh, placing the blocks in one place what, how would it, how would the house be experienced? How and the, the how would it be? How would it be experienced? We thought it was really important to save um, the foundation, uh, save uh, the found uh, image of the found the original foundations for the house because there was a house already on the property, and that's what that blue uh, blue is there. And the the clients were wonderful. They wanted the house to be smaller, not larger, than the original house that they actually purchased for the property. And it was a double width property. And there, they also like, really did not want to have anything too you know, exaggerated. They liked real simplicity. They wanted the house to feel more or less like a museum. And um, it, this is still not the final uh, solution. But we love making these detailed models and even putting little furnitures in them. You know. So anyway, again, there's this great you know, process that one has to go through in order to get to the front door. The front volume is the garage, and the, and, and the final, final scheme, they asked us to do a guest house above it. There it is, and then here it is done. And um, it looks a lot like the model, I think. And you can see how um, you, you enter the front door there. And, uh, and on the way. There's an upstairs terrace. Um, just as you go through that little slit, you can also go in the house that way if you like. And you can see the way it sets up. The house is set up on a plinth, and it runs inside and outside. The client made this table. They, he was, um, well, both of them, but particularly David, was incredibly involved in the process. We're talking about a, a medical doctor. And, uh, a proctologist. A, yeah. 
and he uh, he designed pieces, and we we talked uh, about fifty times a week. And he was just, but they really wanted a good house. They said, "We want the best house you've ever done in your career." So keep, so do it over. Yeah, yeah, no. Not yeah. yeah. <laughs> the best one yet. Yeah. We lost so much money doing this house. No. This, is, this is classic um, working as an architect problem. <laughs> anyway, this slit window was was designed because. Of, we couldn't have any more glass, right? And um, even though they loved the all glass house, and when you sit at the dining room table, it's a perfect view. I sat them there, and we figured out where their eye would be, and and uh, made this slit window so that they would have this lovely view of the water that's there. And that's uh, the the second living room, or kind of a library or family room. There's a TV in there. And you can see there, 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 there's a, we, we were able to capture uh, by all those model studies some, I think, the, the views that they were really after. <clears throat> and this little stairs there on the left go up towards the bedroom. And looking down, and you can, a, a t there's a fireplace, and then within that black steel volume, there's a, a television tucked away. And their view from the bedroom. Again, it's this variety of spaces where you have taller spaces and then as tight and small as possible. So you kind of feel like you've gone somewhere. It's, and also, I think it makes it feel much cozier. And that's, that's the final shot. We got it. First shot. Okay, and I believe this is where we thought we'd be out of time. So what are you guys going to do? We're good for another 10, 30. Sure. Good for a little more? Okay, well this last part is going to be um, a project Kathy and I did together. It's an interesting one's up on First Avenue. And it's for clients. But it's doing the concepts that we got by being developers. So this is actually blurring the line where we're actually coming back and saying, this is what you should build. Here's your building performa. Here's your whole thing. And this is done in conjunction with Woodbury University's uh, MRED program. Um, the students at Woodbury are helping with all the, um, you know, the analysis of the money about all these sorts of things. This is what we do at uh, Woodbury. And, and you know, to get you into a little bit of theory here about this stuff, um, a studio can have, along the top you can see, it can be a single person, a couple, a couple with a child, a single person with a child, two bedroom, two single adults, a couple and a child, three bedroom, you know, and you get down to the four bedroom model, which is the one we find the affordability from. And all of a sudden you see, oh, it could be mom, and, uh, or it could be a couple, their father, or mother, a couple kids, or it could be five unrelated adults, which is an allowed use in the, in the zone uh, in San Diego. So these houses, these are a little bubble diagram of the original go home, basically where the four suites, which are all master bedroom suites, share a kitchen, call it a single family house. And through the years, we started realizing that the one person should have domain over the kitchen. So and rather than having it be, you know, like this, with everybody mad at each other about the kitchen, it's now belongs to the best cook, and you're invited <laughs> to dinner, you know, and you, you treat it like someone else's house. So it gets rid of that shared problem. Uh, and so these two houses, uh, these two buildings were another experiment in trying to get some rather large buildings in an R3 designation, which is a duplex designation, which allows you a 60-foot building on one staircase. So this was a the, the concept was to break it into two duplexes and call this a double duplex. Hmm? Yes, yeah, this was for clients. And, but basically we're, we're, we're doing this, and this is again the process, how we park off the alley, we call this the bear's claw. We get a lot of cars that way. <coughs> the city thinks that's four spaces in their striping, but we always restrike the parking lots after they get rid of their requirement for S350s. This is kind of what the process looks like when Kathy and I play Modelville. And there's the site on Washington uh, behind Panda Express there on Washington. If you ever look up, you'll see these funny buildings sticking up behind. And again, here they sit um, with the parking and the two du a double duplex. Kathy's building is the one on the left, um, which has two suites in it, or has two units in it, so it's a duplex. And the one on the right is the one I did, and this also got two, two units in it. 
but then there are really 14 suites, so it's a way to get the affordability. This is the first floor of Kathy's building, and it, uh, you know, some loft-like structures. Um, try, go, she says go quick on that one. Doesn't like these. These, these uh, um, in interiors, there's the front of Kathy's building on uh, First Avenue. And uh, it's concrete, which is a nice kind of thing. You go up the stairs, um, the yellow is heading up to the upper unit, but you come up the front, you come to this unit that has a uh, bed bunk, a, a bedroom over here and a, and a living room that could be split into a bedroom or, or a rental space. There's a bed that rolls out of the wall that we saw in a uh, old house. So we had to lift the bathroom up so you could slip the bed underneath it. The whole trick with these little tiny units is to get the bed out of the room. And this one got cut back from the front because we were over the floor area ratio. And so we ended up cutting back something and now it didn't count as area. And we ended up with this really tiny unit with this great um, space, the side of it. And then mezzanines. Here are the, here are the two buildings. It opens onto a parking lot. The, if it had been our building, they would have built these screens so that you could close off the lights from the parking lot. I always like this one going back and forth. Right? And um, then the house in the back, there's a garage that sort of turns into a unit with some storage above it. And, and here's kind of a classic go-home plan where you go up to a house, the living room in the middle, two master bedroom suites to both sides, all of them with lofts. So you make a two bedroom into three suites, and that's where the affordability comes from. And there's a, another floor where this one, you're going up the staircase, you pass three bedrooms to the living room, three more lofts, a loft over the... Um, kitchen there again. And these are these 15 foot high rooms which are as tall a building as you can make uh, in a zoning ordinance without counting the floor area ratio twice. Here's the two buildings as they are built and over there. And Kathy's building again. Nine. And that gets us to this, um, this other story which it, again was another stopping point. You guys are, I got another 10 minutes if you want. Of course, when I asked for 10 minutes, you nobody will say no, but anyway, <laughs> here we go. You know, because it's polite. Anyway, the Go Home Tower is this, this story about us always trying to figure a way to do a better housing project. And there's the Merrimack on the left. These are some drawings we did for the uh, Lynn Block, where we were saying, don't build that four-story wooden building over a parking garage. Build on grade with surface parking. You'll make much better housing. So this reputation of ours got us invited to New York for this competition that Mel Bloomberg was having uh, to design um, these little lofts, which are what they're trying to do. And of course, this is, this is a micro unit in everybody's mind. You know, the bed in the middle of the room, you know, that's kind of the classic. So not our project. Not our project, <laughs> by the way. These ones we're going to show you now are not our projects. This was the, the party for the, the competition or for the museum show that we were in. And this, this is uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's house on the bottom. You know, and, and it has some statistics there of how many floors Mayor Bloomberg has. He's got five floors and 12,000 square feet. And here's, here's, uh, here's, you know, 300 square feet, 10 by 30. And that's kind of the competition thing. You gotta put that accessible bathroom in, which is a real problem. And then you, you're stuck with this kind of thing. So here, these are not ours. This is the, what typically happens, bed in the middle of the room, right? Yeah. This is a micro loft. And so you'll, you'll see people go, okay, I'm gonna put in a uh, $2,500 folding bed. And now you could have made a bigger room. So it's the furniture like these, we always think are, this is the most ridiculous. <laughs> you know, somehow that's going to come down and not kill anybody. Can you imagine being a developer and find out <laughs> what happened? Anyway, and we like these kind where they build a funny little niche. It's kind of neat, make a little nook bed. And this is finally a good one we didn't do that we think is really good. Again, if the bed's up on top of the, top of the kitchen. And here's another one I kind of like. Again, there's a little tiny compartment. It takes a little 250 square foot and makes all these tiny compartments. Again, this is not ours. Mm -hmm. And I kind of go, that's kind of neat. You, make, you start making it in to really make it feel small. And then, of course, this is the easy one. You stick a loft up, up in the ceiling. So here's our, our building in the, that we did for New York, um, Go Homes New York. And typically, the party in a high rise is you've got 10 foot floors and you can't afford to build them. And typically, they're double loaded, like a double loaded quarter like this. And so they don't cross ventilate, and that accessible bathroom was always next to the door. You end up with a three foot hallway next to the bathroom, so a third of the unit's gone to the bathroom. And the hallway, the, you know, the dirt's is bad. So even in a single loaded configuration and a 10 foot ceiling, the space over the bathroom's not usable. 
uh, the cross ventilation doesn't work, and you have this big accessible bathroom. So here's our solution. We take the same 20-foot section in two floors and make half of it 7.5 feet high and the other half of it 12 feet high. So it creates this topography inside the room that then allows you to get up on top of beds because the 12-foot portion is tall enough to put a bed on top of the kitchen. So you get the bed out of the way, and you'll also see uh, accessibility happens on every other floor uh, as far as that unit is accessible. We so felt that it, we, it was possible to, um, to stop the elevator uh, you know, every other, have an elevator that made sure it stopped on every other floor. And that also was allowed by the fact that they're shared housing, so there's four suites to a unit, which then helps with the, all the requirements and everything. That can <coughs> so this is that split level section that we wanted to build so bad, we're kind of going, man, this would be a neat little tank, because these are 250 square feet, and we're kind of going, they really live big. They'll feel much larger than they are. The one on the top in this drawing is a classic, um, uh, the same building size, the same 20 foot, two floors. The one on the top is typical what you do, and the one on the bottom is this split level section. That all of a sudden, just by making that little split level, the beds are out of the way, and the whole building become, becomes a really nice, nice space. And you can sit on the steps. I mean, if there's steps, you can, it's a, a place, a gathering point. So these are the plans for New York, and I guess I'll go by as quickly, but you can see in this one a little bit that these tiny little units are really quite livable as far as getting a living room arrangement, a desk, a bed, a bathroom, you know, the things you gotta have in a studio that happen. Part of that strategy is to take the accessible bathroom and make it a screen, so that when you open up the screen, it's big enough to use for accessibility. When you close it, you could still stand in there if you wanted, or if you're like, me, a modern person, you know, there with your girlfriend, who cares, right? Um, so here, here's the bathroom folding away behind that little green door, just makes it go away and no longer gobbles up the whole room. Uh, this is the exhibit in New York um, of the model we made and the, the, uh, the building made of these split level things. Uh, this section, uh, we'll go by past that fuzzy picture, but basically there's the section of the, of the building you can see in this one goes down to a basement and does the split level section. And there's you know places for activity and life to happen in the building. The whole idea is to activate the building, make it come alive. So here's um, you know jazz band in the basement. It maybe has a little window up to the street that people would see. And these guys would end up activating the, the place. So you're gonna hear the music waking up the stairs. You're gonna wonder, who are you guys playing tonight? You need, a, you need another player. And you create the culture in the place. The other thing about these is that they uh, are good, they're very flexible, you could be anything in them, right? So the idea that you could rent a place, have a little business get going, and one of the partners live there to support the startup is, is important to us. And then the, you know, some of the units would be big with beautiful windows, and some of them would not be so good, and some of them would be different. They wouldn't all have the same requirements, so everybody would like to go hang out with other people in their other kinds of rooms and get to know each other, you know, as you do that kind of thing. Um, on the top, a roof garden, you know, hopefully where somebody's up there with a private roof garden and they've got produce to sell the rest of the building. Some of the buildings, some of the units are big enough to put a ping pong table in and you're gonna hear the guys playing ping pong down this hallway, you're gonna become friends. So you create this culture that happens in the building. Took the very best part of the building and put the laundromat there so that that's where everybody would end up meeting each other and uh, hanging out and getting to know each other because you're waiting there for your clothes to roll. <coughs> And then we have the shopkeeper unit, which is kind of the classic shopkeeper unit on the ground floor. And of course in New York, a cobbler shop, right? Mm -hmm. So, which are actually, I've actually been getting my shoes cobbled lately. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty neat because the leather gets really neat and then they're like 15 years old and they've had like 12 soles. <laughs> but um, and on the bottom, bottom, uh, you know, a breakfast place. So we tried to take this, this is the beginning of the Red Office, which is a venture of MRED graduates to try to build some bigger projects. And the idea was as a sweat equity office that we would go do all the work for free with a developer who put the money up. So this one across from Harvard Breakfast um, uh, with Kate Mears, who was an MRED student, who had a contact with a REIT. So we went all out and tried to put the landowner and a REIT together, a real estate investment trust, and do a really large building. That didn't really get, ha didn't happen. But we had a whole lot of time, again, trying to build this split level section. And that brings together the red office a little bit. And the thing about the red office, we're all communists. Everybody works the same hour. So I get paid an hour, and the youngest draft person gets an hour. And all the hours count the same. This is kind of, you know, the bubble that we all live in today. You create your own world. 
Well, I don't like half a liver, you guys. As much as that, I say that, I'm on developing. <laughs> so somehow there's a blend between, you know, you all know the story of Animal Farm, right? You have idealism and, of course, the reality of the, the animals that live there are that some of them become the pigs, some of them become the, the feather feathers. The whole problem that you always hear with it has shown to be true in our office. <laughs> so the first thing that happened is some people discovered you could buy red hours by hiring someone to do that. So all of a sudden the red hour took on a real value. It was worth 30 bucks all of a sudden. And now they were getting traded. Now the, off the hours were getting traded. So this whole communist idea got a little bit messed up. This is the building. Our new building is uh, named after this, the Abopa. It's actually Abora, Abora, how are you going to say it? But it's the, it's the ship in St. Petersburg where the communist revolution began. This is where the mutiny first happened. Uh, you, Aurora. 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 We like to call it a Bopa because we decided it's a Spanish version of it. It's, and this, it's pronouncing the Cyrillic in English. Is what you're that's what we're doing. Oh. Yes, I know. We kind of like doing that. Figure nobody will care. <laughs> and, and we like the little capital B in it and everything. So all that stuff is fun. But anyway, so this is the, the hotel that we're getting ready to build. And this is a, a um, Airbnb concept where we do an affordable housing go home like we normally do. My daughter in law rents five units from me. And she's an artist, and my son's a musician, and they're contributing to the culture of the world, but as artists and musicians and architects and writers and all find out real quickly, you don't get paid, right? So you need a subsidy. So the subsidy is this wonderful Airbnb thing. And so the idea is the problem with Airbnb is it's taking housing off the market that could be housing. But in our case, we do one unit, which is four suites. We have one fully subsidized free unit out of each four that are then managing the other three and then we're sharing the margin between the apartment rent and the hotel rent with the managers that are running the place. So in this way, we're creating all the 10 affordable units that would have been allowed, plus another 30 subsidizing hotel rooms that then subsidize and make all these units free. So it's a market rate affordable housing project that basically has no subsidies other than the, the spare time that artists have. So we have a lot of people lined up who want to be these managers. And when we interview them, we're saying, what do you, do you write? Are you an, art, you're an artist? Do you, what do you do? Because this idea is not to be a manager. The idea is to be your profession and get a subsidy with the Airbnb. It's one skinny little building. It's uh, 20 feet wide and then split in half so the units are nine feet. But this is, uh, this is the Abopa called Hillcrest at this time. You can see I get my little split level section in there. I've got the seven and a half and the 12 foot floors and uh, some stuff that happens like that as the building stacks up into units this way. And you can see how the, how the units spread out on the floor. And here they are, um, skinny little unit. The neat thing about the skinny building is that unlike a typical um, affordable unit that's narrow and runs through the building um, and has a window at one end, and, and luckily if it has one on the other end, this will have windows down the sides of the units. So it'll have a, a, a nicer, uh, kind of light situation that you never typically do, right? To make a building that's the windows are on the side or the long side of the unit. So here you got you end up with beds and top of uh, staircases. Oh, this was a spinning bed. Let me show you this. We worried about the maze, and so we've got spinning beds. And the idea is that you can spin the bed and get that back corner up on a lot. When you when you're making the bed. You but when people it. are in it, it doesn't spin. <laughs> you're not going to let them know it spins. <laughs> It's going to have a special management lock on it, because I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> All right, so, so here's, here's the other, other, sometimes on the lower, on the one story, on the flat ones, you know, you will have a, you know, a bed thing that will pull out. This is funny that the slide actually got in the right spot, but I could actually do that. I was pretty proud of that. And then here we have the fold-away bathrooms, again, in this building. So you don't have the big bathroom, but you can fold it open and make a great big bathroom or even just stand behind the screen. And we want the thing to feel more like a cabin cruiser than a, uh, anything else. And so we're thinking about these rich materials and stuff that'll be in it. But here we are, we actually got through all this, Kathy, and now I can't believe it. Anyway, so we got, we're looking downtown. You can see a boat there in the middle uh, next to this huge development that's about to happen in Hillcrest. And getting closer in on it, you can see you know, where we are on 4th Avenue up the street from downtown. There's been a recent rezoning of the area, uh, asking for 200-foot buildings. Which are all going to happen across and the street. And so area. our uh, 
65 foot building will seem diminutive compared to what the future may be. But it, it does, it, I just wanted to say that because at this point in time, it seems a little bit big. It's going to scare everybody <laughs> to death right now. Yeah. Because it's, it's so, I did this once before. We made a building at three quarter scale, so it looked way bigger than it looked. It looked like it was really huge because it had little windows on it. And so people thought it was way bigger than it really was. In this case, the building is 20 feet wide and 65 feet high, so it looks way taller than it's going to really be. And these other buildings you can see up on the upper left of this picture are also 65-foot buildings. So it's kind of the zone that's coming. But this one's sitting all next to 30-foot buildings. And it's going <clears> to <throat> be controversial. This is also a no hearing, no uh, community group meeting. Uh, we've learned in the MRED program that you go after process one where you don't have any community group input because, it, frankly, you guys, I think, and Mike, so they give me the bad eye. The community groups, to me, have been a real problem in San Diego, and the power has grown so extreme that all the mayoral candidates, the city council candidates, they all organize the, neighbor, the neighborhoods with the community groups, and the community groups are 90% of the time naysayers. There's a bunch of wonderful people in the community groups, but generally, if I can do a process one building, if you see all the new legislation that's coming down, it's all based on not having hearings. If you keep inside the zoning envelope, build your building, and nobody can say anything. And so don't that's ask, you do. don't, don't ask for anything special. Don't ask any for anything changes. outside the zoning ordinance. Just boom, just build it straight. Don't ask for extras. So the neat thing is, is this a market rate affordable housing project? They didn't ask for any bonuses, didn't ask for any special approvals, didn't have to go through a, a longer process to get approved. And and even though the new processes are coming out are much better in that regard, and we're finally out of the ground. Here's a column. And uh, the building is about to happen, so we're excited to uh, to wrap up this very long lecture. Thank you all for paying attention to the whole thing. Thank you.